Hello and welcome back to Clownfish TV. It is me, Geeky Sparkles, and today it's only me as Neon is busy with something else. So you're just gonna get me today. So we're gonna talk about, um, we talked about it yesterday with the, the letter that the Disney board had sent out to shareholders in regards to vote the white card to keep them all in and keep the status quo and why that's a bad idea. Um, at the same time that letter went out, uh, Nelson Peltz and Tryon had also sent a letter out to shareholders and apparently their letter involves voting with the blue card and they specifically have two board members they're targeting for replacement. Um, so we're going to talk about that before we get into it any further, please like, and subscribe. If you do, I'll give you a woohoo, woohoo. I'll try to be good today. I'm not as medicated as I was yesterday. Um, so hopefully I, I make sense. Um, here we go. So yeah, Nelson Peltz and the Trying Group sent a letter out to shareholders after Disney did. I'm assuming it was after. And they addressed what they're what they're looking into and what they want to talk about in regards to the board and the failures of the current board. And they specifically are trying to target um, Michael B. B. G. Froman, and he's been there since 2018, and Maria Elena Logomosino, who has been there since 2015. So you know these people have been here. Um, under Iger, you know, making sure they were his people, that kind of stuff for a while. So here is the letter they sent out to shareholders addressing it. We're going to talk, I'm going to read the letter. We're going to talk about it as we go. So theirs is the blue card. Um, the current board to keep the status quo is the white card. I'm not sure what the color is going to be for the um, Blackwells group. Um, I don't think, I didn't see a letter they put out. I'll look again. I could have just missed it, which is possible because I've been very ill. Um, but here's what they sent out to shareholders. Dear fellow Walt Disney Company shareholder, the Trying Group owns more than 3 billion of shares of the Walt Disney Company because they're controlling Perlmutters and stuff too. Like you, we are enthusiastic owners of this iconic company because we believe Disney is the leading media and entertainer, entertainment business with outstanding assets. Look, I have said, I said last video, I'll say it again in this video. I don't want Disney gone. I want Disney to be good again. I think Disney has potential. Um, unfortunately, they have a lot of entertainment assets, but we're talking Pixar and Marvel and Star Wars. And I think, I hate to say it, but I don't know if they can bring that one back. I mean, Marvel's going to try, I think, with um, Daredevil Born Again and some stuff. But unless we see a drastic heel turn on what they've been putting out, I don't see it getting better. Daredevil 3 and Deadpool 3 and Daredevil Born Again, if done correctly, could help Marvel, but their slate moving forward of what they have and what we're hearing, you know, the rumors all around like Fantastic Four and all that, if they go that route, it's just going to undo all the goodwill you built. You have to put people in who understand the audience and stop doubling down on just race bending, gender swapping, all this shit that you guys have been doing. Um, and just, you know, do good, good shows for the sake of being good shows. That doesn't mean you can't have diversity. You can totally have diversity. That's a misunderstanding. Diversity is fine. It's been around for years. I grew up in the eighties and nineties. It was all over the place. You know, everybody, no one thought twice about it. It was just, that's how it was. It was presented as, you know, here they are. And you didn't think anything of it. It's been in recent years that not only do you, do you have to understand things are diverse, we have to make it a selling point. The whole show and movie have to be about how diverse we are and about the, you know their diversity is their personality. And that is, isn't fair to people who identify in different ways, first of all. And it's not authentic. And people can smell your bullshit a mile away because it stinks. Anyway, you have good things. Star Wars, I don't know what the hell you're going to do with that because... KK has just completely done F that one up, up one side on the other. And if I'm, what I'm hearing about the Ray movie and about Acolyte is true, you're done just going to F it up more. So you do, just bury those ones. They're done. Pixar might have a chance of going back, but again, that's another one where you have people in charge who want to double, triple down on, on politics and agenda and not just making good movies for the sake of making good movies. Till you fix that, your assets aren't worth what they could be worth, which is why you need to get back to telling good stories that are diverse, but are about a good character and a good story and not what color they are, or who they sleep with. You know, if they're, if they're what gender they are, 
you know, you need to get back to just, these are good characters. Here's a good story. And anybody can watch the story and you don't need to know who they're fucking to watch the story. Okay. There you go. Um, beloved franchises like Star Wars and Marvel, which we talked about Disney and Pixar animation. Well, we've talked about that too. Um, theme park and cruise lines. Okay. Theme park and cruise lines that attract millions of people from around the world each year. Theme parks. Yes. Theme parks are good. And they're, they're doing this. Hey, we're going to do 2.5 billion in a Disneyland expansion. If, if we get approval from Anaheim to do it. So that's the difference between Disneyland and Walt Disney World. When they had Reedy Creek at Walt Disney World, they didn't have to jump through hoops. They could just say, yep, we're doing it and do it. Over in Anaheim, you have to like do what you have to do in Florida now and actually play by the rules and go through all the steps. And Anaheim isn't always happy with Disney and some of the shit they pull. They actually were supposed to build a hotel and because Disney moved it to a different location and everything when they weren't supposed to, they had to cancel the hotel permits because Disney tried to pull a fast one. So they're already watching them like a hawk out there. So that's if they can get it past um, Anaheim's, you know, council and all that, they can move forward. Now, that being said, um, I think it's a good idea to build onto Disneyland and I hope they get approval because that is a good idea. Um but at Disney World, they can't just snap their fingers and make it so. And here's the problem. Epic Universe is coming and they're coming fast. And where I personally usually prefer Disney to Universal, I can totally see where Universal's out Disney, Disney-ing Disney. And if Epic Universe pans out to be half as good as they're promising, they're very much going to out Disney Disney. And they're having IP that is more valuable. Um, more people know it, more people are excited about Mario than Mickey Mouse. That's just the way it is. And I'm sorry, but that's, they did surveys. They, more people were happy, identified with uh, Mario over Mickey Mouse. It's where we're at. I can't control that. That's how it is. So they got to bring it. And I'm sorry, a new projection show on the tree of life for Zootopia isn't going to cut it. Um, you know, a, a reskin of dinosaur with Indiana Jones, like Disneyland, is cool, but it's not going to cut it. Plus, Neon's salty because Dinosaur is one of his favorites. Um, Country Bear Jamboree with IP songs, not going to cut it. You know, you need to do more than that if you're going to compete. And then, meanwhile, Universal is opening theme parks potentially in Great Britain and over in, you know, Vegas with their Halloween Horror Nights and in Texas with a kids theme park. They're all coming for you. You know, you need to to do better and you're not. You're also making it, you're turning away your core audience because you're making it too costly. And I, I get that's a delicate dance because, you know, you're spending all this money on stuff. You have to make it back somehow. So you're going to have to charge more. But I think people would pay more if they got went back to the, the Disney difference that we used to see. It, it was worth the extra money, but it's not now. And you need to fix that. And there's a perception here that you kind of created that you need to, to fix. So that's where we're at with that. Um, Disney Plus, an emerging streaming giant with a library of enviable content. Disney Plus is, has potential, but it's not been handled the way it should have been. And that's, I think, Nelson Peltz's main sticking point is you should be where, like, net, well, they're not going to be where Netflix is. I'm sorry. They're just not. But you should be heading that way more. And, and they're kind of stalling out. And it's an issue. And I think they're going to, like I told you before, try to like, you know, do like a little sh three card shuffle here about, you know, oh, we're going to, we're going to go join this group and this group and make sure that people have the, the Disney Plus as part of their, their cable package so they can count each one as more subscribers. We're going to probably see more offers where you get free Disney Plus with something. So they, they need those subscriber numbers up to look like they're competitive. Um, I think we're going to probably see more of that. We saw them doing like big deals on it before the end of the quarter or end of the fiscal year last year to try to up those numbers for the end of the year reports. Disney occupies a unique place in the hearts of millions of people with its deep history of captivating stories while creating unforgettable experiences. Disney has so much potential and that's what's so heartbreaking about all of it is that I remember Disney when it was like 10 years ago, when it was good. I remember Disney when Jay Rizzullo was there, and we're going to talk about that. And there have been so many changes made of late and so many missteps and misspending, uh, the overspending by Iger. And some of the things that have been, they, they focused on streaming and I get it, but I think that, that you've broken your focus to many places. If you focus on too many things, right? It's like multitasking. If you focus on too many things and you take your focus onto those things, other things lose what you're 
focusing on. They lose that. They lose something. You can't do all of them well. You know, jack of all trades, master of none. And Disney used to be a master at animation or a master at theme parks. And now they're trying to do streaming and they're putting all this effort into streaming. Um, and then like Marvel and, and, and Star Wars. And they're just splitting themselves in the too many different directions. And they're doing it all poorly in each one. Like they're not, they're not dominating in any one area. They're losing the title to DreamWorks, to Universal, to whatever, because they're not... They're so split, they're not focused. You know, it's just too, it's too divided. And I think that's a problem. Um, despite Disney's enviable and unique position in media entertainment, its stock price is half of what it was less than three years ago. True. Disney shareholders like you and us have collectively lost nearly 200 billion, 200 billion in our investment in that time. Disney's recent creative efforts have disappointed its once loyal customer base. True. And have caused losses for shareholders. True. Disney's recent creative efforts, you know, with things that they put out to the theaters have proven to not be things people wanted. They're quadrupling down on live action remakes to me is just absolutely stupid. Um, the direction they took Star Wars in is absolutely stupid. I mean, I think if they had gone more like with the expanded universe and the legacy stuff and like, you know... You didn't have to heir to the Empire, Dark Force, Rising, Last Command. But if you did something more like that, I think it would have done well where you continue with Luke. People would have been fine with it. And there were strong female characters brought in that were dominant lead characters that you could have brought into that. Instead of vilifying the old characters, you could have used the old characters to build upon to add new characters. And you didn't do that. And meanwhile, we're getting more live action remakes that nobody wants. They are dwindling returns at the box office. We keep seeing them put out Marvel films and no one's going except for Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 because they're like, what the hell is this shit? I'm sorry. It is what it is. Truth is the truth and the truth, the proof is in the pudding and we're seeing that proof. Disney was forced to cut its dividend and only recently restored it. Now that partly is because of the you know pandemic and stuff too, if we're being fair. I mean, there were some reasons there. Meanwhile, shareholders missed out on more than 12 billion in expected distributions between 2020 and 2023. All right. So that's, he's, their course, people are like, what about the customers? They're all about shareholders. It's a company. Disney is a company. Disney has been all about shareholders for a long time. If you want to see change, the only way you're going to get change is if um, shareholders are making money along with the changes. You're not just going to get changes because, you know, you're the customers. They're only going to be forced to make things when their jobs are on the line or when shareholders are demanding it. It sucks, but it is the reality of a corporation. Disney's stock is down over the last one, three, and five years. In fact, over those time periods, Disney's total shareholder return, TSR, has significantly underperformed the stocks of other media and entertainment companies. Despite Disney's superior assets, which I agree, they had so much potential, capabilities, and businesses, Disney's TSR has underperformed the S&P 500 by a wide margin over each of those time periods, too. Neon has brought that up a few times if you've watched our videos, that they aren't even anywhere near the S&P 500. One year ago, three years ago, five years ago, or 10 years ago, you would have been far better served investing in an index fund like S&P 500 or a basket of Disney's self-selected peers than Disney itself. Instead, you like us have been caught in the Disney mousetrap. So we're talking about the competitive, competitive advantages. Why has Disney cost shareholders so much? Disney has lost its way, yes. Agreed, 100%. You can sum up all of Disney's problems, I'd say in the last, uh, at least, oh God, I wanna say decade, but yeah, it's probably been about a decade. We're heading into about a decade now, um, at least eight to 10 years. You can sum it all into this. Disney has lost its way. Iger is there. Iger is so focused on his legacy and putting out books about himself. He was so focused on kissing China's ass to get himself a biscuit. He was so focused on trying to get himself some political aspiration, you know, some job, some, you know, being president, what he would talk about at one point, or being sent as an ambassador or something, that he has been so focused on that. And some of the board members have been focused on using the Disney board to promote their personal things. Susan Arnold, for example, who isn't there anymore, that they have lost their way. Bob Iger is too busy acquiring and borging the hell out of entertainment. And then while they got these, you know, big IPs that they're, touting is why they're, you know, we have some of the best, you know, IPs in the world. You did, but magic comes to the cost and you overspent. 
on a lot of it, okay? It's just the truth. Disney has lost its way. That should be on a t-shirt. Disney has lost its way because that sums it up right there. The company's creative engine has stalled. True. For the first time in nearly a decade, Disney has lost its position as the highest grossing movie studio. Yes, Disney's last five films have collect collectively cost over $1 billion to produce, and yet two of these films have lost money, and another barely eked out a profit. True, Disney's reputation as the world's preeminent entertainment company and the flywheel that drives its business is at risk. Being an entertainment company, putting out the Disney animated movies, entertainment company with the theme parks, that kind of stuff is what Disney was about. It's at risk. Agreed. 100% agree. Disney Plus, the emerging streaming business, has been poorly managed. Yes. Since the service was launched in 2019, Disney Plus has failed to achieve profitability in any fiscal year. Now, to be completely fair, I want to be upfront about this. Disney said from day one, when it came to Disney Plus, they did not plan on being, uh, you know, making money, being profitable until 2024. They were upfront about that. They have been saying that the whole time. So, you know, you can't really ding them too much on that because they did tell shareholders up front that would be the case. But what got interesting to me when I'd watch the investor calls was as we went on, they stopped reporting on things. Um, they would only report on like generalizations or like how many subscribers was that, but they wouldn't let you give specific information anymore. Like they weren't like breaking it down like they used to. I think when they saw that they were going to be held to standards, they changed that. But it isn't profitable. And I think part of the problem was they were trying to go with quantity over quality. Um, they did ask Bob Chapik about that. And he said, well, you have to make more stuff to get people to subscribe. And that's the endless cycle with these subscription models is people are paying money. They expect new content all the time. So you have to constantly balance, you know, the quality and if it's worth the investment for people and making money for the company with people wanting new content and the churn and stuff all the time time and that's the issue they're seeing they have not made money because they overspent trying to make content um also they've made some big missteps i think they're charging too much i think actually putting the ads and giving people a lower rate for ad with ads is probably the way to go i mean i personally like ad free but not that it matters because you're paying extra money and you still get damn ads that's a whole other story but when you're watching hulu and you literally have like eight minutes of ads it kind of makes you be like what are people that are paying for ads, you know, paying or that aren't paying for the ad free? What are they getting for ad chunks? Because it's effing nuts. And while Netflix generates attractive profits, margins, and cash flow from its streaming service, Disney at Disney success at Disney Plus has been elusive. And he does keep comparing Netflix to Disney. The difference is Netflix has been doing this for years. Netflix is the behemoth, and it's way ahead of everybody else. Today, Netflix generates approximately 21 cents of profit for every dollar of revenue. In its 2023 fiscal year, Disney lost approximately 14 cents for every dollar of streaming revenue. Part of that, too, you have to understand, that's going to depend on what number they're looking at. Because you'll notice a lot when they're showing the numbers that they would exclude Hotstar because it's cheaper and they, and they weren't making, like, I think it was, like, where you'd make, like, so much money profit on everybody else. It was like way less. I don't have numbers in front of me, but it was way less on Hotstar. So a lot of times they would say, here's a number excluding Hotstar. So I think part of that has to do with, you know, where it was and how much they were charging to. In total, the stream business businesses have cost the company more than 14 billion in operating losses over the last six years. ESPN, ESPN's another big one. ESPN's is challenged, but is challenged and lacks a clear strategy. ESPN is one of the most respected brands in sports media. Okay. But the once lucrative business has suffered as cord cutting has accelerated and sports rights costs have dramatically increased. Sports rights are ridiculously expensive. ESPN also has spent how much money on having talking heads do these shows and these celebrities are really expensive. We saw cuts not long ago. Because they're overpaying for the talking heads. That's not helping either. ESPN has continued to shed subscribers and investment into direct-to-consumer app appear to lack clear return targets and payback is uncertain. Operating income for Disney sports segment, which includes ESPN, dramatically declined in 2023. Prices have gone up in the parks even as investment has deferred. Disney's parks have long been the crown jewel of the company. True. And remain an important part of its future. And they need to do something or it's not gonna. 
But even though admission prices have increased by more than 35% over the last 10 years, Disney recently revealed the need to invest a whopping $60 billion into its parks and cruise lines over the next 10 years, seemingly to catch up for delayed or deferred investment. Well, part of the problem is Disney Cruise Lines, they have a bunch of boats coming out. Now, Disney Cruise Lines are really popular, though, because it's like you, you get a Disney experience without going to the parks, but they're very, very, very expensive. And I've noticed on a lot of their news ships, they're putting more and more money into the deluxe, you know, richy, rich people suites and stuff like that than they were for some of the older ships. But they're putting a lot of money into that. But the parks are behind because you haven't had, I mean, you do have some new things, but like they cut a lot of it back with like Epcot. Yeah, while you did get the, you know, Remy ride, which was a clone of the one they already had. And you did get the Guardians of the Galaxy Cosmic Rewind, which is amazing. And I love it. And I can't say enough good things about that one, other than the fact that it's really dumbass to put steps at the end of that ride because people are going to fall down because you just spun a whole bunch. And you might want to put an escalator there. But, you know, no, you put steps there. And that was dumb. But that's a whole other argument. They were supposed to do a lot of things. And now we got the little garden that looks like a, 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 a vagina instead of the big, you know, festival pavilion that was supposed to be there. You know, we have um, Journey to Imagination that looks like dog shit and they need to fix it. And that's the one thing people keep asking for that they keep refusing to do. They were supposed to put a Mary Poppins ride. There's supposed to be all these different things they cut. They keep cutting things. And that's a big problem. They overspent on like, gar or like Galaxy's Edge. And then they cut a lot of other stuff. And, th and then they how much the money they spend on... The Galactic Star Cruiser they shut down. And you know what they're doing now with the Galactic Star Cruiser? Um, where you, When you come into the into Galaxy's Edge Batu and they let you off of their boxcar into the park and they have this whole place, this area only Galactic Star Cruiser people can go to. Now it's being used as an upcharge photo opportunity because that's the, after they spent all that money, that's what they've turned it into. Um, that's where we've, we've come to. So they've wasted ideas that could have been successful if they had done them right. They overspent on this stuff. And meanwhile, they're letting other things fall apart and it needs replaced and it needs fixed. And they're just, you know, it's just a big old crapshoot. And they need to do a lot more. They need a fifth gate at Disney World. They're not, they won't do it. They kept teasing things like what's beyond Big Thunder Mountain and you never heard anything else. And then meanwhile, Epic Universe dumps the stuff they're putting out. And while it might not be, people are arguing it's not the best thing ever. I think it's significantly, it, what it's going to look like from what I'm seeing, it's going to be a significantly immersive environment. People are going to go there and actually, I'm in the Ministry of Magic. I'm in Burke. I'm at, you know, in the castle, at, you know, Frank, I think it's like, I think it's Dracula's castle, or I don't remember which one it is, but you're in the castle. You're actually in the places you know. Galaxy's Edge, instead of putting you in Hoth and putting you in Tatooine, they're just dropping you in a place and ever, you don't know where you are. It's some new place that you can make your own story. People don't want that. They want to be spoon fed the damn story. You don't go on vacation to have to work for it, you know? Unless you're a LARPer, you're not going to be into it. Um, and I think that's the big problem they're having. And they're going to have to play catch up because everybody else is kicking their ass. Disney has failed to answer how it plans to compete with Universal's new attractions. They aren't answering that other than, hey, guys, we got a, we got a new projection show on the Tree of Life and the Country Bears are going to have a, a, some new IP songs. While it has not kept pace with development, how and where this money will be spent or what return shareholders can expect to earn on this massive investment? Well, $2.5 billion is supposed to be Disneyland if they get it approved. I know that much. As a result of these and other issues, and despite spending $200 billion in 2018 on assets and acquisitions, 20th, 21st Century Fox included, Disney's financial performance has suffered. Operating income, free cash flow, and earnings per share have declined by 18%, 50 and 85% respectively since 2018. In our view, Disney's strategic missteps and declining financial performance can be laid at the feet of the board. Yes which lacks focus, alignment, and accountability. They have no accountability. There's people on, the, on this board for years and they were there with Iger. The reason is, is because Iger wants people he can control, okay? That's why they're there. They will focus, align, and be account, they won't have accountability, but they'll focus, align on whatever Iger tells them to focus on. And the problem is Iger made a bunch of dumbass decisions, including 21st Century Fox for $71 billion. They're talking about the board's lack of focus. Many of Disney's directors have important day jobs running some of the largest automobile, apparel, sporting goods, and software companies in the world. They have demanding full-time work commitments and are likely waking up every day thinking about things other than Disney. Well, that's their job. Faced with com complicated challenges in their executive roles, we believe these busy directors have taken their eyes off the ball at Disney. Lack of alignment. 
This is not management directors have amassed great personal wealth, having received in the aggregate more than 700 million in compensation from their job at companies other than Disney during their 10 years on a Disney board. Yet, despite their significant resources and sizable investment portfolios, Disney's 11 non-management directors appear to have so little faith in Disney's future that they have purchased a total of no less than $350,000 of Disney stock during their 10 years. Now that's a valid point. This is a very valid point right here. And, um, I agree with this completely. You're on the board. You're supposed to be like, you're supposed to be so, you know, directing where Disney goes and you don't put your money where your mouth is. You aren't putting your own money behind it because you don't want to lose money. What's that tell you? This is a very, very good point right there. Nine of them never bought a single share. Nine of the 12 board members don't have a single share of Disney stock, but they're on the Disney board. So they're not, I mean, part of that's good because they're not like, they're not beholden. They're, they're making decisions. They, well, you would think they were making decisions based on customer and stuff like that and not on their own financial gain. So on the one side, you can argue that's a good thing. However, on the other side, they have no vested interest in it. So they make dumbass decisions that hurts the company as a whole and doesn't keep the company around another hundred years that doesn't impact them in any way. Okay. So that, there's, a, there's two sides to that one. Meanwhile, Disney CEO Bob Iger has sold nearly all his Disney stock, right? And he went and turned it and put it around and invested it into like NFTs, uh, metaverse stuff, and Funko Pops. Um, re- reaping proceeds and cash more than one billion. Today he has left owning comparatively few shares. So we have Iger with not many shares, the Disney board with only three hundred fifty thousand dollars worth of Disney stock, and then they they think they should dictate everything to shareholders. That is, of all the points he's making, I think one of the most valid right there. Lack of accountability. Despite years of Disney's underperformance and shareholder discontent that have been repeatedly expressed at Disney's annual shareholder meeting votes, true, the board continues to claim it knows best, refusing to heed input from shareholders or add shareholder-selected directors to the board who can bring fresh perspectives to Disney's challenges. They keep saying whenever they bring up a month's a shareholder that that's not a good enough reason to be on the board. Well, I think that's a hell of a lot better reason to because you're directly you're you're directly um, involved in the fact that you need to make money. So you want the company to do well. You want the company to please customers. You want the company to you know do well as a business with with your fan base, your 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 loyalists. You want it to do well. You want it to perform well. You want it to make money because then you make money. When you have no money in the game, no skin in the game, you know, you're just going to go along with what Iger tells you and it doesn't it impact you either way. Oh, well, people don't like these movies. Pfft. Oh, well, I don't care. I get a, I get a check mark for my DEI initiatives. I, I you know, so they don't care. They're talking about the Restore the Magic website and about fixing Disney's problems. Now, here's what they're asking. They're asking to replace, or they're asking to replace two people on the board with Nelson Peltz and Jay Rizzullo. So here's where they're talking about why they should be on the board. Peltz basically owns more than three billion Disney stock. He is one of the most experienced directors in corporate America, having served with more than a dozen public companies, including, you know, Procter and Gamble, Unilever, Wendy's, Heinz. So yeah, the course those aren't theme parks or streaming places. So there is that. During his tenure on these and other boards, he has helped create tremendous value for shareholders and drive important initiatives, including leadership succession, which we need here. Management compensation realignment, which we probably need here, organizational improvements and operational turnarounds. Those things are relevant. They're like, he doesn't have experience, you know, with entertainment business and stuff like that. Doesn't matter. He does have experience with succession, management compensation realignment, organizational improvements and operational turnarounds, which are not directly, I would say, you know, you don't have to work for like entertainment specifically to be able to do that. Rizzullo. Now here's where he comes in and he brings that. He owns more than 600,000 of Disney stock, which is, um, which is almost twice as much as what all four board members combine own. He is a Disney veteran, spent three decades at Disney, five years as CFO. Um, he was stock prices increased by more than 250% and the company paid more than 8 billion in dividends to shareholders. Prior to being appointed CFO, he ran Disney's parks, resorts, and businesses. Yes. During which time the parks and resorts division delivered consistent revenue and operating income growth. He ran the parks and resorts before he was CFO and they, they, back when it was doing well, okay? Um, real change is needed. 
there's much to be done and to like consumers again and drive value for its owners. Right, because when you make consumers happy, they spend more money. And when they spend more money, shareholders make more money. So when they're arguing that, oh, they just, want, they just care about shareholders and all that. Yes, true. However, to get the money that the shareholders want, you got to get the customers to spend the money and come back and go to the movies and go see, you know, consume the, the different content. Subscribe to Disney Plus for new things that are good. You need to make customers happy to bring the money to the shareholders. And the problem we have is Disney doesn't care about customers being happy. You know, they haven't cared about that for a long time, for whatever reason. They just go after the wheels with a shit ton of money. Hence the cruise line expenditures and everything else. People go on those, spend a lot more money. You know, that's why they're going for that. So if elected, Peltz and Rosulo want to do this. They want to initiate a board-led review of the company's creative processes and structure so that Disney can once again claim its number one position at the box office while consistently delivering industry-leading content and Disney hallmarks. However, I will say as a caveat to that, you need to make sure you trust your creatives. Trust your Imagineers. You know, a lot of them have really good ideas, and I don't think they get the, they get the support that they should get. I don't think they, they, they basically go about cost and I'm worried that they're going to be worried about cost too much that they, they don't let them do what they need to do. And I think if you want to be number one, you got to let them, you got to let them fly free and see what they can do. I think you need to. Insist that management finally develop and implement an ex executable plan for the stream business in order to achieve Netflix like profitability. You need some kind of plan because you don't got one now. Having the leadership team commit to a detailed plan that includes a reasonable payback period and return profile for future investments and direct-to-consumer ESPN. Press management to disclose the expected returns of the $60 billion of announced investments and parking experiences businesses. What are you going to spend the money on? You're saying you're going to spend it in 10 years, but what exactly is that money going to? Align pay and performance for the company's senior leaders by tying compensation to clear, measurable, and ambitious goals. Agree with that too. Financially execute a successful CEO succession process. Yeah, Iger's here. And we're supposed to, oh, trust me, guys. We're working on a successor. I swear we're working on a successor. Where? Have you heard anything about a successor? Other than, oh, we're going to hire somebody, but you never hear anything about it. And then Iger gets an extension on his CEO contract. Exactly. While cultivating a deep bench of cable next generation leaders. I think something else you need to look at, and I think that's what you're going to go with some leadership you, you hire and stuff, is I think that the cast members need to be, you know, paid better. And I think the cast, people at Disney need to understand, they make these choices up here, but it has to go down to the cast members to implement them on the front lines. And I think the reason people see a Disney difference besides the attractions and things like that are the cast members. The cast members are what bring people back over and over. They're the ones that give the little magical moments and stuff like that. I think if you want to get customers to keep coming, you need to bring that Disney difference back. They're already trying, but they're limited. You need to bring it back the whole way around. You need to make sure that you are, the, the reason you cost a little more is because it's worth it. And you need to reward your cast members who are bringing that to people and bringing customers back. Because I don't think they get as much as they should. And I'm just saying that. And that's probably not going to look good because they want to save money to make more dividends. But I think if you keep your people happy and you make customers happy, it's going to benefit you in the long run. Um, they're talking about voting for them using the blue proxy card. They want you to withhold. Here's the two people they want you replacing. We are strongly recommending shareholders withhold. On Michael Froman and Maria Elena Laga Mazzino, or how the hell, uh, Maria E. L. Maria L. Withhold Michael Froman. Okay, this is interesting. Because his wife has a longtime personal relationship with Iger's wife. Okay? They don't know why he's on the board. He spent much of his 25 years as a financial executive, a federal trade representative, and a national security advisor. But yet he was pointed to the board. Now, they're claiming Peltz can't be on the board because he doesn't have this background needed in, like, entertainment. Well, this guy doesn't either, okay? It appears that Disney is equally mystified by the company's own omission. Mr. Froman possesses just one skill that's central to Disney's strategy. Mr. Froman has never served on another public company board. He also does not appear to believe in Disney's future the way we all do. Throughout his tenure as director, he has never bought a single share of Disney stock with his own money, okay? And he's been on there since 2018. Withhold the Maria L because she is a chair of Disney Compensation Committee. She's chaired the Compensation Committee since 2019 and been a member of that committee since 2015. 2015 is when she was added to the board. During her tenure on the Compensation, Compensation Committee, 
They have overseen payments of over $800 million to Disney's executives while shareholders have suffered, with Disney's stock losing nearly 20% of its value and your dividend being significantly reduced. Among other things, she oversaw the awarding of a four-year compensation package to Bob Iger valued at more than $250 million in connection with the value-destructive but board-endorsed and unanimously approved 21st Century Fox acquisition, which you've heard me mention many times. Furthermore, she has, her background in wealth management appears unrelated to any of Disney's businesses. And like Mr. Froman, hers possesses just one skill that's central to Disney's strategy according to their own analysis. They'll give you like breakdowns of why they're important to the board. They're asking that you withhold those candidates or on withholding the candidates nominated by Blackwell's Capital. Now I will say on Blackwell's Capital, um, they have a couple people I think that would be good fits uh, for the board too. So anyway, there, the rest of the letter you can see on Yahoo, but that's most of it. They're basically, you vote with the blue card. They only mentioned it a couple times as opposed to Disney mentioning the white card like four times. But that's what they put out as a letter. They have some very valid points. I think that, you know, a couple of their points, yeah, you know, I think you could argue for and against if you're being fair. But they have some very valuable points like Disney needs to return to what it was. Disney has lacking the magic. It's not what it used to be. There needs to be some some defined directions that we're not hearing. There needs to be a succession to get Iger out of there. We're not hearing. And the board, a lot of them are put in there by Iger. Or they're friends of Iger. So, of course, they don't want him gone. They brought him back. And everybody's like, yay, Bob Iger's back. And we were like, no, this is not a good thing. A lot of the problems they have have come from Iger. Sorry, this is a long video. But there's what Peltz and, and Tryon and, you know, Rizzullo have basically said in response to Disney. So uh, please comment below. Let us know what you think. Like and subscribe. And I'll talk to you later. Bye.